Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank God it's Friday, like some of us, we always say, but for different reasons. I'm happy on every day of the week. Today, we have a very, very special person with us. His name is Obinaya Abadre. He's the CEO of Idea HMO Limited. And we are going to be discussing a very important topic, understanding the HMO ecosystem and providing healthcare for employees. Of course, HMO, as we are all aware now, is an acronym for Health Management Organization. I would like to introduce him briefly, but before I do, please, in the next one minute, kindly reach out to your colleagues, friends, professional associates. This is a session you should watch live and not the YouTube link. Okay, and you can also, as always, drop your questions your thoughts in the chat box is going to be engaging and very practical. Okay, Obinaya Abadre is the current CEO of Idea HMO Limited. Proud to now, of course, this is a position he has held over the last six years. Okay, HR people, so you know some employees don't offer out. Proud to now, he has been with the Standard Bank Group. He held various positions, some of which include egg business transformation for the rest of Africa. You know, he was also an executive director at Stambic IBTC for over three and a half years. He was head personal and business banking. He was head wealth management. He was acting CEO, Stambic IBTC Pension Managers Limited. He was COO and later executive director at Stambic IBTC Pensions Manager, Managers. For his academic qualifications, he holds a bachelor's of science in actual science. I believe that is very close to insurance management, actual science from the prestigious University of Lagos, the only Lagoon Front University. He also has a master's of business administration from Imperial College London. He has quite a number of certifications, um, which include Chara Institute of Bankers of Nigeria, Chara Institute of Stock Brokers, and Chara Institute of Management Accountants. Obinaya Badre is someone I've also had the privilege and pleasure of knowing personally at close quarters, and I must say he's an extremely humble. You see, I've also dealt with him as a client and um, he is responsive, his team is responsive, his organization is responsive. I reached out to him and without hesitation, we just had to work out a time that was actually convenient for all of us. Please let us receive to this platform, Mr. Obinaya Abadji. You have the please. Thank you very much, Yemi. I really appreciate that introduction. Good evening to everyone that is joining us and thank you for the opportunity and the privilege to be here with you. As Yemi said, um, when he asked me immediately, I said yes. Well, for two reasons, really. Reason number one is that in my book of deeds, all right, I'm hoping that I will continue to store goodwill with Yemi. I do believe that he's doing great things and over time that he will be gifted to achieve really mighty things. So what a way to improve my own standing with him over time by ensuring that I score some good marks in his book. You never know the future. Um, but beyond that, for the second reason is that um, for many years I've been interested and intrigued by the HR profession and the ability to transit from just being um, administrators to being thinkers, strategic leaders, because ultimately business is about people. So any opportunity I have to contribute to the work done by the HR community is something that I treasure and regard as a privilege. So um, I'm really grateful again for the opportunity to be here with you. Um, knowing that uh, we expect many more people to join us, um, I think that I, I will just get into my presentation and as we go along, take questions. I'm going to share my screen. And even though I, I normally I try to keep things as brief as possible, because I think that any idea or thought that you have can be expressed as succinctly as possible. The 
brief out the, 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 summer, the summary of it, the easier it is for people to ask you plenty questions. And because the subject of health insurance is something that is really topical, it has been over the years and will be more so as we evolve as a people and as a country. Um, so I think it's important to allow plenty of time for uh, questions that people might have. Um, I will say from the beginning that the rules of engagement are as follows. Nothing is off limits. You can ask me any question that you want about the subject. You can ask me questions about myself. Indeed, if you find that there's something that will be of interest to you, and I will gratefully answer. I only ask that I'm given permission to give answers like it's none of your business if I think it is so, or I don't know if I don't know. So I will not tell you a lie where I do not. All right. So subject to these things, I will share my screen and um, start with my um, session. Okay, where is that? I think this is it. Yes. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so the, the um, let me just get this view. Um, full screen, yes, that's there you are. Okay, great. So the um, topic for discussion today is really understanding the HMO ecosystem and providing healthcare for employees. But I've, I've narrowed it to understanding what the HMO um, um, business and operation is about, all right? So that everybody can think about the value of this service in the grand scheme of things that you're offering to your staff. Please, if you have any issue or challenges, you cannot hear me at any point in time, please let me know. Um, yeah, so I think that should be all right. Okay. So, uh, no, let me go back. So yes, so if I start with here. So I, I start by asking myself, why is this of interest to everybody? What exactly is the proposition that corporates have towards their staff that makes the HMO service of, of any interest at all? Um, I'm very outcome focused. And I try to maintain the discipline of connecting things. So if, if, if I'm doing something, there's a reason why I'm doing it. There's a purpose for the activity or the action. Nothing exists in a vacuum. So it's very important to understand from the beginning, why is this happening and what is the benefit of it? So there were three things that I highlighted as the um, benefits of the proposition that uh, the HR community offers. Why is corporate healthcare useful? I don't claim to know it all. So if I miss something, I'll be very grateful to learn that to add it. So one is that the corporate is trying to leverage its size and credit worthiness to provide a good value plan to staff and their families. Now, please note that I've, I've called it a good value plan it, is not, it doesn't have to be the best plan, all right? It, there are a number of issues that come together, but the most important thing is that, is that the plan delivers good value to the participants. So that the, the word best is something that varies depending on where somebody is and all. And what you might continue best might just be average to someone else, depending on the size of the company, their focus and all that. So as long as the plan is of value to the staff and their families. It will meet the corporate requirements based on their size and credit worthiness. The second um, part of the proposition is that the staff can focus on their work, knowing that any health emergencies for their families will be adequately covered. Now, this is really important because one of the things that destroys businesses, either because people become unavailable, um, directly or indirectly is health emergencies. One of the biggest killers of SMEs is actually ill health. Many people think that it is the absence of money. No, it is that the proprietor or key staff took ill, all right, and resources were diverted towards addressing that or time was diverted towards addressing that and that became a problem and the business went under. For large companies where key staff 
take ill or their family members take ill and they prioritize that. The company suffers untold productivity loss because of the absence of these people. So trying to get staff to focus on work, knowing that their emergencies have been taken care of, the chances that anything will go wrong has been taken care of is really important for companies and their staff, particularly key staff. You know, the other day I was talking to someone that works for Google and they or worked for Google and he said he left. And I said, why? He, said, he wanted to get a life. I'm like, what does that mean? I thought Google was one of the best places to work. He said, yes, that they provide you all of these things so that you can focus on work. So what you then had happened, sorry, someone was looking. Because someone's asking me to speak louder. All right, okay, let me try that still. All right. So somebody, or the, the guy was saying, in essence, that they've done all of these things so he has no excuse not to pay attention to work. So he literally had to tear himself out of the organization because he needed to sort some personal things, but he had no excuse. Now, similar, you don't want people taking time off to go and address medical issues for their families and all that because they could not have the thing taken care of in another way. So it's really important to have a plan available for them. The third um, reason in the proposition is that for many people, in their productive years, especially when they are raising families, this health concern is a key issue. So you find people that are more likely to jump from job to job because they are looking for extra money to ensure they can meet their health requirements or their family's health needs, right? especially during the time that they are raising families. And that's taken care of immediately once you remove that as a burden. So these are yeah, items in the corporate proposition that make healthcare valuable component of that. So, so why HMOs? Why not just solve the problem like you have always solved it over the years? The first reason is risk transfer. Over the years, what had happened was that companies had tried to do uh, retainers. They had tried to pay bills as the thing goes, but, over, but the cost just keeps climbing. And because you don't know what the cost of the event will be when it actually happens, trying to um, minimize that cost by transferring the risk of the variations, all right, was what uh, health insurance essentially was providing. The second uh, benefit of the HMO service was benefit administration, because you had many people have several uh, um, hundreds of staff, their staff have family members. How do you keep track of all of those things? And the health insurance service and the platform brought the ability to be able to administer all of that without increasing the operational work of the HR function or the admin function. Then you have better pricing and discounts. Because HMOs could aggregate the demand by different corporates, it gave the corporates in effect um, a better price because there was someone that was negotiating that with the providers versus trying to negotiate at the point of care or at the point of need where you might be a single person with a requirement and you therefore have no market power. Then the last part was provider access. Because hospitals, yes, yeah, some of, of them stay long, some fold up and all that. How do, does one curate a book of hospitals across different geographies where people have a need can go there? Now, obviously, some companies said, oh, we have the capacity, we can hire staff, but it, it increasingly becomes inefficient, especially as hospitals change, markets change, needs change, doctors change, requirements change, and not just hospitals, diagnostic centers, pharmacies. So that need to be able to get access to a book of reasonable providers for staff to use now made HMOs attractive because they were doing the work on a full-time basis, saving the, com the companies from investing in doing that work by themselves, especially where they might not have the technical expertise to do that. So these four things make HMOs very attractive to corporates and the community as a whole. So how does health insurance work? You know, I did to put this much information because I think that if people don't actually understand what is happening, they will make all kinds of assumptions, whether right or wrong, because nature of course. Yeah? We are seeing your front cover. Is that where your slide is? No, my slide is on slide four. Can you see me? 
we've only seen the front cover only. I don't suspect it. So just one second, please. Let me, let me go out of this. Yes. So we didn't see slide two and three at all. Oh, wow. Okay. I'm going to go out of this stop share and just check that this. Sorry about the people. I'm going to go back to share screen. Okay, you're now yes. seeing slide two. Please tell yes. me, are you seeing slide three? Yes, yes. Slide four? Yes, please. Okay, all right. So, oh yes, it says participant can now see your application. Okay, just quick recap. Uh, in slide two, I spoke about the proposition and the three key drivers of the corporate healthcare proposition. Then I talked about why HMOs and I spoke about four reasons and four benefits that HMOs brought to the table, risk transfer, benefit administration, better pricing and discount, and access to providers. Then I came here to talk about how it actually works. And here I was saying that I was so bold as to try to provide inside information, detailed information about how it works. Because personally, I believe that the better people understand something, the easier it is for them to extract value from it. But the easier it is for them to ensure that they too know their own role and the thing can be mutually beneficial and sustainable. And I will spend some time here. So first of all, I wanted to walk everybody through the process flow for an HMO. Essentially, uh, so this is the access to care journey map. Staff members are enrolled, all right, and they receive their onboarding details. From there, if they have a need or when they have a need, depending on who has a need, they can call on the doctor using virtual care platforms or they go to a hospital in the network, all right? There, they are validated with their number, ID, or whatever the process is. And once the hospital validates that, all right, then the, host, the, the customer can be treated. And once the customer gets the care required, they leave the provider. End of story. Whilst this seems simple, all right, all kinds of things can happen, all kinds of things can go wrong. From the point of enrollment to the point where care is needed to even the service point at the hospital where people are supposed to validate other people. So the hospital needs to know, is this a valid person for me to attend to or not, all right? And what happens when care is received or not? So all of these things are really important steps in the journey map that once people understand how this thing is supposed to work, then it's easier for them. I'll give you an example of the difference between how we manage healthcare in Nigeria versus what happens in other parts of the world. So you have, and I'll give three scenarios. Um, scenario one is Nigeria. Generally, what happens in Nigeria is that people go to hospital and expect to access care and the, if the hospital will build the insurer, that's it. So they came to hospital with a mind that they will not spend any money on hospital. End of story. Then you have the version at the other end, like the NHS or um, uh, in Canada, the Canada, Canadian system, or, and do, uh, there are also qualifiers, but let me just say that broadly. All right, so in that system, you go into hospital, and the insurance system now controlled by the government will cover the bill. So again, the person doesn't spend any money. Then you have the hybrid in between. This is done by international insurers like Bupa, Cigna, Aetna, all right, or in countries like the US and South Africa, all right, or Australia, depending on where you are. So this is the hybrid that is most common, where people go to hospital, Depending on the nature of the plan that you have, you might need to pay part of the bill, all right? Sometimes you, can, you, you pay part of the bill upfront, sometimes you get your invoice at, after the fact, or you actually, um, you don't pay part of the bill upfront, but you actually have part of the wallet available. And I'll explain that. So when I lived in South Africa under the discovery system, all right, with the bank when I was living in South Africa, 
when you go to access specialist care, you pay and you claim from the insurer. Specialists in South Africa don't collect insurance, all right? You pay them there and then you, they'll give you a receipt, you take it back, send it to your insurer and they refund you the money subject to your plan. When you go for things like optical or dental, you have a wallet where they give you some money that you can spend out of. It's almost like a, a, a cash amount, right? But that cash amount, once the demand is more than that amount, you have to pay the difference. So that's kind of how their own system works there. In the US, all right, you bought a plan and the plan will have deductibles, which means that when you go to pay, depending on the service, you might have to pay part of the bill upfront or you, the, 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 the hospital will send you a bill after for your share of the bill and they will claim the, the balance from your insurer. My point in explaining this is that there are different methods. So it's really important to understand the method that is working in your space. And there's no point making any assumption, right? Because all of that is in your insurance contract. So that's all the process flow. And, and, I, and I hope that people will ask more questions about that process flow. In terms of the income statement, I, I, again, I think it's important that people understand how is money made here? Because sometimes people assume that, oh, the premium that they give to HMOs is profit. All right, it's not. So if I'll explain this, when you enter into a contract with a health insurer or HMO, as we, are, as we call most of them in Nigeria, this is the premium contracted. I put XXX here because if the value can be, it varies, the value varies, but the timing of the conversation really matters. Now, that value is not income in the HMO's uh, PL. That's why I haven't put a number. All right. So this is the value of the of the contract for the period defined period. Maybe it's a year or whatever, but that's the value. However, the income of the HMO is the amortized value. So that's the 100%, which is the premium contracted divided by the period of their financial year. So if you start your plan in January, for example, then the entire 12 months of the premium, if it's a contract for a year, will enter the HMO's income. If you start your plan in July, then only six months will enter that year. The balance will enter the next year, all right, from an HMO income perspective. Then after that, you have the medical cost incurred, right? The medical cost, all of it goes into the financial year because as events occur, all right, and that's the matching principle in accounting, all right? So the events occur, when they occur, the expenses ties matched to that time. All right. So when you have all those things that happen, what you then have happen that your medical cost incurred is in, is, 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 is hits the income statement as it occurs. All right. Even though the, the premium income is spread over the contract period. Then, of course, you have acquisition costs, and this is the income statement. And I'll talk through it very quickly. So your, your premium income is 100 percent The medical cost incurred, all right. Let's assume it is 80% of the premium that is spent. In reality, many companies find that they are spending, the HMO is spending more than the 100%, all right? Either because they price the plan very badly or because uh, more people are going to use the plan and their costs are more than the HMO expected. So the, the medical cost is more than 100% of the premium. But let's just, I say for the sake of argument that the medical cost is 80% of the premium. And medical cost, remember, is the payments made to providers already as cash and the provision for things that they've already done and have not yet been paid for. Then you subtract acquisition costs. Acquisition cost is really what you what the HMO pays to brokers or, or agents that are used by the company. Again, it's common practice for companies to use uh, brokers because insurance brokers help them to place their businesses for whatever reason. But when you do that, it's not all companies that do it, but some companies do it. So on average, let's say it comes to about 5% um, of the income, all right? Then you then find that another 5% leaves as acquisition costs. So when you subtract 80% medical cost and 5% acquisition cost, what you have is an underwriting profit of 15%. 
Now, even though many companies have been trying to reduce it, but let's say if all the companies were paying their premium in advance, like they should, then the company, the HMO would have received the money up front before spending the money later. And then when that happens, what generally then follows is that the HMO would have had cash which they would have invested. On average, depending on how big the HMO is, their investment income will come to something about between 2 and 4% of their premium income. So that's why I just took about 3%, the midpoint there. So this is the income on prepaid cash. So you add that as, a, as additional income to the HMO. And then you now subtract staff and admin costs. Again, depending on the size of the HMO, uh, what they pay their staff, and what their general operational costs are, on average, you have about 15% of revenue that is spent on operating costs. So you can imagine that where you have this, the HMO's profit before tax is a mere 3% margin. So if any of these variables changes negatively by more than 3%, this HMO will make a loss. That's how thin in the, from a margin perspective, the business is because most of the money goes into medical costs. If this medical costs, uh, medical loss ratio should go by as much as 5%, and all else being equal, the HMO is going to make a loss. If they find themselves paying more money on acquisition costs than expected, they're going to make a loss. Even just trying to increase staff salaries alone will easily lead to them making a loss. That's, that's, that's why the marketplace runs on very thin margins, but over the long term, all right, if they do it properly, they should always be fine. That's why you will find that your HMO will try to increase their prices if they find that the price doesn't make sense. So what's the role of the HR in optimizing the HMO service? I think it's two key things from my perspective. One is education, all right? You, you, you really want to educate staff and their dependents. Now, it's easy to, to outsource the um, service and say, oh, the HMO, go and, um, go and uh, educate your customers. But you're really, going back to the original point about why the healthcare proposition makes sense, do you really want to outsource your value proposition to a third party to communicate? Ultimately, how your staff feel about it, all right, is, is a function of what it is that they were told or and how it is that they were told. So you, you, you may want to think about maintaining control over that communication. But whatever the case, the communication is key, all right, to ensure that people are responsible for the scheme and reduce abuse of the scheme. There's something that is called a moral hazard. Moral hazards generally arise when people, because people behave differently when they have no responsibility from when they do. You will find, for example, that if so, if you tell someone to pay oh, the bill right. at the hospital, the person is more likely to. Sorry, let me see. Someone said you could not hear me. No, your volume is good. We are tracking. I have okay. five people tracking this session from various. All right. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, um, what you'll find is that people want to do what makes it, what is convenient for them. That's how human beings function. They want to do what is convenient for them. But if you send somebody to pay the bills in the hospital by themselves, they will be very judicious about what they are spending money on. The moment you tell them that the bill is to be paid by somebody else, then they want to take everything, bells and whistles, because it's not their cost. That is called moral hazard. There's nothing you can do about it. All you can do is to reduce the incentive for people to do so, and you reduce that incentive by, by giving them knowledge and making them responsible for managing the cost of the service. Ultimately, the cost is going to come back through higher premiums all right, across the entire industry if it's not managed. And that's what you see, because if the HMO makes a loss, in the end, it must be transferred in one way or another. That takes me to the second rule of the HR is to ensure that you're dealing with a profitable HMO. Because whereas people say, oh, if, if they don't make money and they raise their prices, I'll go to the next HMO now. There are many of them, or right? I'll always find someone that can do my rates. Yes, you'll get around the market eventually. But more importantly is that even if people then don't uh, tell you that, 
you might find that you are now exposing yourself to a scam where somebody is willing to take your premiums, but when you get to the point of care, the person too behaves that way and say, well, you know what? It was not enough, so I'm walking away. Sure, you might say, I'm going to go and sue them, all right? But hey, if somebody's already broke, what's the point of suing him? You are going to spend more money uh, chasing what might not come out of it. So you really want to ensure that the partners that you're dealing with are credible, that your partners are actually profitable because only profitable businesses are sustainable, just like yours, right? And ensuring that all stakeholders are accountable, payments are made on time for premiums, so you can hold people accountable for rendering benefits in line with the um, agreements. So I, I think in my view, I feel like if the HR people are, are, are focused on these two things, it's easier to build an ecosystem that is sustainable within which the true benefits of the HMO can be harnessed. All right, so what, but what are the challenges? And, and, and really I'm coming to the end of my presentation so I can go into questions because I'm hoping that I would have provoked some people to ask a lot of questions. Um, so what are the challenges that we, that we are facing here? I just keep checking to be sure that, all right. Key challenges, one, understanding. Because where people don't understand the purpose and then the long-term benefits of health insurance, all they focus on is pricing. They're looking for the cheapest plan, all right? But the cheapest plan may not necessarily be the plan that you need. That's why corporates have the advantage to have plans designed for them with bespoke benefits that meets the, station, the, 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 the need in time of their, of their staff group. You can imagine that a corporate that has an average, that has staff with an average age of say maybe 25, who are largely unmarried, their needs for benefits like maternity or childcare and all that, all right, are limited. If the bulk of your staff are there, you can have the plan redesigned and focused on what they need rather than simply taking an off-the-shelf plan. Knowing that as the staff age or the staff station in life changes, you can then modify their plan benefits to be more appropriate for what the people actually need. And it can make sense to everybody. The second um, challenge that we have is affordability. This is not the company's fault. It's a general Nigeria issue, all right? If you look at the um, GDP per capita in Nigeria, it's less than, what, uh, $2,000. So which tells you essentially that we are really not that wealthy uh, in nation. So if, if our GDP per capita is so low, all right, then what are we going to do? In, in By the time we finish dividing all the money, all right, people cannot really afford to be paying expensively. I mean, if I look at the average premium in dollar terms, and, and this is when you adjust for the exchange rate, it makes it even worse. So there was, if you look back, Nigeria was, um, think it was what? Well, let's see, your average um, policy was maybe like forty dollars per annum. Yeah, it can be like as as low as that. But if you go to Ghana, it will be three times or four times that. The US, they are they are actually paying premiums of, 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 of several, maybe like even 10 times that on a monthly basis. Meanwhile, our rates are annual. So really, really, when we think about um, pricing, it's more an issue of affordability. So how do we address the affordability issue? Meanwhile, the service you're spending money on, the cost of it is climbing. So if people cannot afford to spend a lot of money on services that are getting more and more expensive, we need to be thinking about how do we redesign the insurance plan so we can still give them the benefits that they need. The third thing, yes, I hate to say it, but it's true, corruption, all right? Yes, I'm gonna say it, all right? It is true, it's happening in the market where many HR staff begin to act as brokers and agents and they take commissions and kickbacks to place their health policies. It's a problem, it will eat up the entire marketplace. These things, they start small, then they grow legs. And when they grow legs, they, become, they go out of hand. It's something that we need to find a way to address within ourselves so that we can have a more professional arrangement. Then the, the HMOs will always have the incentive to give the commission because for them, they'll write us as a cost of acquisition. 
But in terms of what it does to the professionalism of the HR community, I think it's something that needs to be thought about properly. Then the beneficiaries themselves are a challenge, all right? Several people end up with an, an entitlement culture, which leads to bad behavior and ultimately value destruction. And of course, internal pressures on the HR community, hard times and corporate cost pressure will lead to pressure on health benefits. You find people that will compromise on the benefit that they will give the staff, they will trim things and all that because they're trying to manage the cost. Because health is something that it moves, it doesn't, it doesn't move in line with the economy. Its direction is always up in terms of cost. So we are looking for where to cut costs. Ultimately, you're going to say, look, you know what, we need to shave off something from this health insurance expense because it's so much. So these challenges are real challenges in the marketplace and something that people need to be thinking deeply about how to address. But the good news is that all of these things are surmountable and they are simply opportunities for innovation. Now, I apologize in advance if anybody feels like I should not have said something that I said, uh, but I'm just being candid from my perspective about some of the challenges that we have. Now, why did I not list a challenge here as HMO profitability or HMO service? It's because at the end of the day, all right, everything is about accountability. Once the HR community understands what the market is about and what they should be doing, it's easier to hold every other counterparty as a supplier accountable. But if people don't understand, they don't know what levers to pull and where to ensure accountability exists. So from the perspective of the HR community, that's why I just presented these challenges this way. Um, the last slide that I have before I take questions is just a bonus slide that I added. All right, again, I wanted to trigger the conversation on the potential impact of the, of the new health, National Health Insurance um, Authority Act of 2022. Four things that I highlighted and a few questions I thought to address immediately. One was the issue of compulsion. Because health, because health insurance um, is being made compulsory, so nobody will have the opportunity to say, I'm not involved or not involved. In the end, the government will have systems to ensure that people are caught, just like they are doing much better in the pension space. You will have variation between states, which will affect nationally spread organizations, because the way the act is designed now, every state will define its own um, um, basic health insurance plan. So you're not buying the same plan necessarily across different states. You might buy the same um, private insurance top up on all your plans across the states, but you need to be part of the state plan in the first instance, and that will introduce some variation. So you have to think about how to manage that variation. Then you need to understand the rules for private insurance on top of the state cover. Because the, the, the law now says that before you can get private insurance, you have to get the state, the basic um, state cover first. So how what are the rules and how does that affect your organization is something that you need to be aware of. And the fourth thing is that overall, it just means higher costs. All right. And one should not think of this as being a problem. It's actually just reality and it makes sense. The question is how do you optimize it for yourself? So yes, higher costs generally, but it does not mean that your own costs need to rise. The, it's a function of how you understand it and how you bring it to bear on your organization. And in case you wondered, A, can you do away with private health insurance? Rather unlikely because the public systems cannot deliver the care needed. Never mind what politicians promise you, in the end, they cannot. Um, two, can you just go back to retainership? That's rather unlikely as well because insurance compulsion already locks you out of that option. So you can say you will buy the um, state basic insurance and use retainership for anything else, but then you're back to the original reason about why it almost made sense because it gave you ability to address issues that created problems of for operational efficiency for the organization. And I'm not pitching HMO, that's not my goal. It's just simply to trigger a conversation about what is the potential impact of the NHIA Act 2022 on your businesses and how you deliver on the corporate healthcare proposition to staff. 
So this was my last slide, and I can then go to questions. Uh, so now, uh, just to address this, I think that what I may do, uh, Yemi, if this is okay with you, I'm going to run through the comments that have been made in the chat box and see if there are any questions to address from there. Then we can now take more questions. Yeah. Oh, thank you. If you also have questions, kindly begin to type in the chat box. Oh, it's okay, Rubina. All right. Thank you very much. So, um, Yes, so the, with the first comment, HMOs run on a thin margin. They need to be super efficient. Absolutely, absolutely super efficient. So you'll find that HMOs are going to have to decide what and what will you have people involved in versus what you will not have people involved in. So you're going to see a lot of automation in the industry. Um, and you're already, there's already a lot happening, but you'll see a lot more coming into the industry. Then somebody um, said, uh okay just one second i'm scrolling down scrolling down scrolling down scrolling down introductions oh yeah someone raised the issue on the kickback and entitlement by hr i think you should not be encouraged but most times hmo reps are the ones pitching the idea that is very true very very true but you know desperate people do desperate things all right so you you can't it's difficult to stop people from tempting you is really about moving yourself away from the temptation. Um, and look, I think if we're honest with ourselves, it's not something we can eradicate, but certainly I think it's something that people need to be conscious about avoiding because by the time somebody is offering uh, a commission in exchange for the business, then really what benefit are they really offering? Is that the value they're delivering or just something that is designed to um, tie you into them? What well, is just my opinion. But I agree with you, you should not be encouraged. Um, so someone says um, they don't have a choice considering the fact that there are competition out there and this HR will pitch their tent to the competitors. Well, to be honest, if the HR is going to pitch their tent to the competitors, which is what led them to offer the commission, then the HR that moved was not really persuaded about value. They were just looking for what's needed for themselves as persons. Um, but hey, I think enough said about that. Um, knowing our government, we can't do away with private insurance. That is true. The reality is that the public hospitals, very few of them are actually able to provide meaningful service. The teaching hospitals are trying to upgrade themselves, but they are really tertiary and specialist uh, centers. So primary care is going to end up largely in the, in the public, in the private space. Add to the fact that many of the doctors in the public space already have their private practices. So they have, a, they have incentive to move the care outside of the public hospital. In countries like Australia, they've tried to address that. Or I think UK too has adopted a similar approach where you have to register to be able to operate on both sides. All right. In, in New Zealand, I think they don't allow them to operate on both sides. You have to choose whether you're a public or private practitioner. But in Australia, they allow them to operate on both sides, but you're registered to do so. Uh, but in any case, our, our regulation is not yet advanced enough to address that. So you're always going to have that and to lean towards private because of the costs. Um, someone asked the question, how do we bridge the existing gap uh, delays with specialized care, especially when in release of personnel gets to providers for service, loss of manpower mostly? So what happened, it's a great question. Um, what happens with international insurers like Bupa and Cigna and Aetna uh, is that they require the enrollee to call the HMO and get a code, first of all. So they, they, they have the approval before they go into the hospital. Mm -hmm. So when they get there, the hospital is just asking them for the approval, verifying it and then going, moving on from there. The problem we have in Nigeria is that because of the weakness of our regulations and our laws, the enrollees don't know. So our people are not really as enlightened or educated. So when they come to the HMO to ask for approval, they don't even know the right technology. Many people don't even know the drugs that they are on. They just give them something in, in, in a transparent uh, nylon and say, this is the drug. If you ask them what drug they give you, they don't know. They just give me medicine. All right. So those things affect the, um, 
affect the understanding of people and make it more difficult. And providers have an incentive to ask for all sorts. So if the enrollees are the ones asking for the codes and they go to the provider, provider will just inflate everything, take you to the, uh, give the enrollee, and really will ask for all of these things. When they go in, they may only do a fraction of that, but how do you maintain an account for it? So in the end, premiums will be rising for care that was not given. So uh, the answer, how can we improve that? I think is to continue to educate everybody so that there's escalation. Sometimes the delays are actually not delays. I give us one example. I went to a hospital once myself and I spent an hour, 20 minutes, all right, in the hospital. And somebody asked me, was there delay? There was no delay. I was number eight on the queue to see the doctor. All right. So after everything said and done, I waited 40 minutes. No, it was more than that. They waited almost 15 minutes to see the doctor. They will not chase the person that was before me away now. They have to attend to the person. If they chase them away after two minutes, when I get there, they will chase me two away after two minutes now. So I waited my turn. So I cannot say that there was a delay. So I couldn't say that. But some people go and the moment you don't treat them, they say that there's a delay. Is there loss of manpower? Absolutely. Absolutely. So part of the things that we are advising people is to adopt virtual care. For primary care incidences, you don't need to go to the hospital. You can actually call the doctor from home or from the office and all that. If you do that, it's only when people are going to see specialists. And when a person goes to see specialists, you know the person is out of action. So you're not under undue pressure. There's no perfect answer, really. You just kind of have to find a balance and just remain attentive to the issue. Um, someone asked, take us through the procedure of onboarding a new HMO when there's an existing one. Okay, my advice to HR practitioners is, again, that's why I, I went at, and showed the income statement of the HMO. If you feel you want to change your HMO, all right, it's important to know why, but let's skip that part. Let's just say the decision has been made but you need the HMO, all right? The moment you have decided on who the new HMO is, Please sign a contract with them before your existing plan expires. All right. So that you know that you have a plan in place before your existing plan expires. That way you can provide them the details of the staff to be onboarded. You can register all the people and go through that process and have it completed before the existing plan expires. So you'll be able to continue seamlessly after that. But if you want to um, get an, a new HMO, you can go through a bid process or go through a recommendation process from other companies that have used HMOs, all right? But you, you have to decide what your procurement process is to ensure you're getting the best value. But I, I do recommend that you adopt an approach that's very clear about what it is that you want. So you're forthcoming with that. So people are pitching to you based on what you want. And please do not do lowest price. Everybody has an incentive to protect their position the lowest price is hardly ever the best value, hardly ever. So it's important to be clear about what you want and then make sure you get a good price for it. One trick you can try to do always is to ask people to see if they can give you, a, if they can price you a capped increase for the second year. Because when you tell an HMO that for the second year, you want to pre-agree the basis of the cost increases. All right. It makes them feel comfortable that they don't have to go through this process again and enables you to get a bonus in terms of the discounting process. But, it, but by elongating that relationship from one year to two years, you can improve your overall um, total value and cost. Okay. Someone says people are already saying HMOs are scam, that they prefer to be collecting their money and not pay to HMOs. Hospitals don't treat them well once they discover it's HMO. How do you educate them? I think the first thing to understand is that the fact that people say that um, governments steal money and that the taxes are not used, does that mean that people should not pay their taxes? No. If people want to take their money from you, would they say that HMO is working? No. But the moment you give them that money, are they going to spend it on their health care? No. They're going to consume it. And when they have a need, they will come and be begging you and be doing go fund me for you. That help me, help me, help me. So it's something that as a value proposition is a benefit in kind, not a benefit in cash. So it is not their money. It is their benefit. 
So the focus must be on trying to improve the benefits. That's one. Two, hospitals don't treat them well once it's discovered as HMO. Before uncle, all right, the, the hospitals are human beings. If they know that if I rubbish you, if they know that if I rubbish you, you'll come and pay me more money or you'll stop me from being held accountable by the HMO, will I not rubbish you? I'll rubbish you now, all right? It's incentives. If people insist that the value is in the accountability of insurance, then eventually the providers will align, right? But if they allow the providers to be badly behaved and they support that, then the providers will not be aligned. So it really is, is, is we have to decide what it is that we want. The system is, everybody is trying to maximize their value in the system. Value cannot be maximized without trade-offs. And the trade-offs are actually in these things. So you have to educate your uh, colleagues and enrollees that, look, this is a benefit. If somebody mistreats you, it's important to take it through the process so that the provider is held accountable for that. And if they do that often enough, they'll be delisted. Then they'll go from getting a smaller amount to getting zero, which they don't want. So they will come in line ultimately. But that engagement will also ensure that everybody that is, that, is, that is not holding their part of the bargain is then held accountable to do so. But like any um, a process, whether it's staff evaluation and uh, performance improvement processes, you must establish a process that ensures that people are held accountable and is transparent and that people know that the consequence of being found one thing is that you'll be removed from the system. The system will not be removed from you. It is you that will be removed. Once people are clear about that, then everybody aligns because long term, the only way to manage risk of the type that we face with healthcare on an aggregate basis globally is health insurance. Mm -hmm. Health insurance, whether it's public or private, that's the only way. Health insurance is not for rich people, though. it's for middle class and poor people. Rich people like Ali Kodangote, they will just buy the hospital and buy the doctor. They will have a personal physician. They don't need health insurance. So the people that need health insurance are people like us, middle class people that they give you a big bill to pay, but you will not be able to write the check. So we cannot allow what is in our best interest long term to be destroyed by people being funny. Okay, I'll just move on. Um, facilitator, most private HMOs are not completely honest when signing up deals. Can a relief coverage be made known to them at the point of contract signing? Most personnel come back screaming, blaming providers for denial of care. Oh yes, get the benefit, get the list, get the coverage listed out. That's why I thought about contracting early. If you don't see what people are covered for very clearly, all right, then you don't know what you're covered for. In fact, let me tell you one good excuse that people um, have is they say, oh, I want unlimited benefits. I had a conversation with one HR lady and I asked her, she said she wanted unlimited benefits. So I asked her, I said, is your premium unlimited? She said, no. So I said, what does unlimited mean? All right, that you can incur any costs. So my balance sheet is not unlimited. Are you saying that if the cost you incur is more than my balance sheet, forget your premium, that's more than my balance sheet, I will go and borrow money to meet it. If I say yes to you, am I not lying? Can you not see that I'm lying? So why will you ask for what is not possible? So you want to know clearly from the HMO, what is the limit of the cover? What is the limit of the expense? I had a, a friend of mine that called me one day. They were not using our HMO. And he called me and a staff of his had ended up in a hospital at night in an accident and emergency and their HMO had disappeared. They could not be, nobody could be reached. So he called me that night. I called the hospital, but I told the hospital, it's not from us, so I'm just helping you. Oh, please build them. Is there any issue? Let me know. So, of course, they did not reach the HMO. In the end, the hospital had to send them the bill directly to pay, but at least the person got attention at that time. Well, my point is that it's important to be very clear about what is co covered. Don't accept all those very bland, covered, 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 covered. What is covered? Understand what the limits are. Because it is when you need it that you will now start hearing the fine details. Mm -hmm. Do HMOs remit premiums back to the company if no staff visited the hospital in a year? The answer is no. It's insurance, all right? But you can build that into your contract. There was a client once that came and said to me that 
we have we've had a good year all right we want a discount i said no what i can do for you that if you are sure you'll be having a good year let's agree now up front that if your loss ratio is less than 80 percent this is the cadence of how much i will give you back as discount if but if your loss ratio is more than 80 percent or, or no more than 90 percent for that had that band of 10 percent with more than 90 percent this is the cadence of increase you will do in the next year at first the person said no then he came back i said to him but you can't be serious if you want me to share the upside risk with you then i must share the downside risk with you he came and signed a contract for that business the next year the following year his, his loss ratio was over 100 percent did we have a discussion no he just paid his new premium. So it's important to think about what exactly is going on. So yes, you can write a contract from the beginning that says that if I have no staff visits to the hospital, you pay me back. But then the person will also ask you, if you exceed your premium and all that, then you're going to increase. And this is how much you're going to increase by. Someone says, um, thanks for the presentation, but I'm kind of surprised you didn't list as part of the challenge profit maximization on the part of HMOs and HCPs, which is not wrong, but doing so at the expense of adequate Medicare. So it's not, I already explained that I that I, I came at it from the perspective of the HR, but to address the conversation, at the end of the day, this is a, a commercial contract. It's not a charity. It's not an emotional conversation. I'm sorry. I just need to be very blunt and direct with you. If you have signed up for a, a, a plan that has this benefit limit, the moment you exhaust that benefit limit, you're entitled to zero after that. Because as long as you are within, you will spend. So it's very important to be very clear about what your plan benefits cover and what they don't cover. And that's the advantage that corporates have because you can create bespoke offerings that are more appropriate for your needs. But once you understand that you can put in place things that override, like I had a client once that came to me and said they wanted some additional benefits and all that. And I said to them, I can give you this benefit, but if you want my advice, don't do it. And they said, why? I said, because the chances from our data of this happening is very, very small. And if it occurs, it's better for you to pay the bill for that event at that point in time than for you to buy a policy that has it for everybody, which is what they did. It did not happen. So they saved that money. But it's really about being clear. Every business exists to maximize its returns. And profit maximization is not just about money. It's also about relationship maximization. So it's important to understand what the HMO or the healthcare provider is seeking. But you cannot understand the logic of all healthcare providers. That's why you want to understand your HMO and ensure your plans are very clear and their ability to honor their commitment is established. Someone else adds, well done, sir. I think the enrollees should be enlightened concerning primary care and secondary care. Most times, enrollees believe that once they get to hospital for investigation, they should be attended to immediately. You are absolutely correct. And, but it's a joint effort between the HR and the HMO, continuing to enlighten people, making sure we have the data to send them messages, help them. They, look, the reality is that, imagine that you bought a plan for, or family plan for your staff, principal, spouse, and four children. That's six people. If only the principal gets the messages from the organization, that's one sixth of the population, 17% that got the message. That's all. If the principal and spouse got the message, you have moved to 33% of the people, the beneficiaries actually understand how it works. So you have to be thinking creatively, how do we ensure that people understand how to access care? And the fact that hospitals are not uh, hotels. I remember having a client that called and was very upset but they were so upset, they refused to speak to any staff and they demanded that I come on the phone. So I got on the phone and the person was screaming at me. I told the person, please, you are my client, but don't shout at me. Don't do it. I'm a human being like yourself. The person was first taken aback. See, I have a health emergency. I understand. Shouting at me does not change it. Can you please tell me what the problem is? So he said that they were in hospital and the doctor was attending to them and the doctor now left and did not attend to them anymore and kept them waiting. And I'm like, really? Please hold on. So I had the relationship manager put the hospital MD on the phone 
all right what happened the person said that yes they were attending to them but somebody was brought in, in an emergency so they had to leave and then go and attend to the emergency that came in so i asked the enrollee so i asked them did they tell the enrollee they said yes so i said but you were told say hey but why did you finish attending to me first i said eh. Hey. Imagine if you were the one that was brought in in the emergency. You want them to finish attending to somebody else before they come and attend to you in the emergency. Is that what you want? If you treat other people the way you would like to be treated, will the world not be a better place? I don't have a problem telling people honestly. I know it's harder for some people to do so, but I think that some of this education helps everybody. We don't have enough manpower in Nigeria to separate ER from regular care but we can keep working on the conversation and the education. But definitely something that we must improve on. What advice will you give to nationally spread organizations in choosing the best HMO? Well, the first thing is to choose HMOs that are actually also nationally spread. You can't get skill by fragmenting. So you want to get skill by matching it with skill. So you do, you, you, once you're, you're a nationally spread organization, your book of HMO options narrows to those ones too that are nationally spread because otherwise you will not get the scale operationally. Okay, um, what with the market differential, what plan does Hygia have to upwardly review their tariff to the provider? So actually what we do at Hygia is we don't give providers tariffs. We actually ask the providers to give us their tariffs. We actually found over time that when you give providers tariffs, what happens is that you, as the HMO, you must be revising the tariffs all the time. But the provider operational positions are different. Some are more efficient than others. So you can find two providers similarly located. One has a lower tariff than the other, either because they look for a lower margin and therefore they want more, more throughput in their organization, or they're simply just better operators. All right. So you don't want to take on that risk of trying to manage everybody's operational cost. So let them quote their tariffs and then you then categorize them within bands. So that's what we do at Hygia. So what the, but the risk that we face as a result is that people then come and revise their tariff over time, which is what we have been seeing over the course of this year. People are revising their tariffs over time. So what we try to do is in our contract with them, they give us a couple of months notice, anywhere from some refuse to give us up to three months, but maybe we can get 30 days to 90 days notice of a tariff change. And that's how the tariffs keep changing with providers. But obviously you know that because the providers change tariffs, eventually it means that premiums have to change or sometimes the provider tariff changes so much, we have to recategorize the provider and they are no longer available to some people. Um, Someone then said, thank you for your response on the loss, on loss of man hours. I suggest we make HMO process seamless and user-friendly. Health insurance should be standardized in line with best practice. Um, in principle, yes, you are right, but a lot of things depend on, ad on uh, adoption and levels of education and understanding. So for example, you have some people that are more willing to use their phones to do certain things and some that are not. And because you have people also who are minors, and therefore might not be in the hospital with phones or devices, or people are sending people with nannies to take children to hospital. It's kind of, it's not that straightforward, but in principle, I agree with you. I think one place that a lot of difference will happen is if more and more people adopt virtual care for primary care and adopt the emergency response offerings in the marketplace today, it will help to remove a lot of the noise around people uh, suffering from time losses and all that. Because today, the, the, I mean, it's simply a, like a call, like this is a Zoom call or something like this. You can speak to a doctor, get a referral if you have to go into hospital, go into the pharmacy direct, go to do a test direct. You don't have to go to hospital and you can do it from the comfort of the office or from your house. So it will save a lot of time. Now someone asked what and what should you look forward to while choosing an HMO partner for the HMO partner for the company as an HR. I think um, you, you don't want somebody that is struggling to make money from their business. You'd be surprised that I went for that first. Yeah, because a sustainable business is critical. So the person already has business logic and they know that to be profitable, they're going to have to balance the book. They can't charge clients too much. They can't overpay to providers. So 
Some people just say, I'll pay the provider anything and just increase your premium. That won't work for you long term because in the end, your premium is more than you can afford. So you need the HMO to be deliberate about ensuring accountability on, on the use of benefits. But you also accept the fact that they must charge fairly because providers and their costs keep changing with exchange rates, inflation and all that. So the, the, the transmission of value across must make sense for everybody. So if, if someone that's running a sustainable business is very, very important. If somebody's business is not sustainable, they shouldn't bring their, their trouble to you because at the end of the day, they're going to transfer those loss-making activities to you to resolve. Two is the transparency of the benefits. People should not come and tell you things that is covered, is covered unlimited, unlimited, unlimited. Those are lies. They are lies. You know, even if they are sweet to the taste today, in the end, they will run belly. So you really want to understand what is the real benefit. If you tell me that this benefit is unlimited, you are mad, go away. Because how can I pay you 10,000 Naira and you give me unlimited benefits? All right. So I can incur 10 million Naira of, of care costs on 10,000 Naira benefits with only 50 people? Come on. Then you don't know what you are doing. You're going to make losses and create problems for me. So go. Right. So once you narrow things down like that to what makes logical sense, you can begin to push somebody to give you more benefits. All right. So uh, like somebody might, might have his own multiple as 20 times premium. Somebody else might have his multiple as 15 times premium. At least you know what the multiple is. You can begin to say, okay, how can I get a little bit more multiple? How can I change it? How can I change that? And it makes sense. And you yourself can see how it makes sense. Now you understand how the income statement works. But you see how it makes sense. They too have staff that they have to pay salaries to now. Those staff too want increases. So where would the money come from, Biko? You know, so you have to think about all of these things. And there's no charity anywhere. If you don't know who the fool in a conversation is, then it just might be you. So someone says, follow up to the question around uh, companies with national spread. Medical attention is also somewhat personal. For companies who are used to reimbursement schemes moving over to HMO, what's your best advice on how to deal with em employees requesting they want to continue with their hospitals of choice, which may not be on the list of the HMO? I think there are two ways to handle this. One, obviously, is to see if there's a way the HMO can add the provider, all right? Um, and then people can have that hospital. Option two is to ask the people to pay and then make a claim. Because if they pay the hospital for the care and they go and claim from the HMO subject to their benefit limit, then they too will quickly decide whether it's the hospital that they love or the care that they need. And if there's another hospital on the network that can provide the service. But I think it, everybody needs to be pragmatic and one needs to be listening to other people to do it. We tell clients that they should suggest and recommend hospitals. We About 70 or 80% of the hospitals that clients suggest we end up adding eventually over time. The problem is that when you add them, they might prove to be more expensive than the customer's premium. So they still don't have access to that hospital, but that's a different discussion. In principle, you are able to add many of them, but there are some you will not be able to add. So, so I think people just need to be listening and then create new opportunities. Sometimes people are using that provider because that was what was near them or they know the person there. And therefore they can also put pressure on the provider to come on board. But after everything said and done, people may, need to make the most rational decision for themselves under the circumstances. Um, why is it difficult to replace an enrollee who resigned from the company service with a new employee? I think it's about time. So you think about it that so you paid you paid an HMO say ten thousand naira for one. If I let, let me use let me make it simple twelve thousand naira. So it's effectively the equivalent of one thousand naira per month. And the let's say they were using a ten times multiple. So they gave you paid um, twelve thousand naira. They gave you one hundred and twenty thousand naira worth of benefits. Then the enrollee has been on the scheme for six months. All right. So they, but that enrollee in the six months, they consumed the entire 120,000 Naira worth of benefits, or let's even say they use 100,000 Naira worth of benefits. If the enrollee resigns after month six, haven't consumed the entire or most of the benefits, when you replace the enrollee, what benefits would they consume, would they get? That's the question. All right. So you will find that what we try to do, for example, is that we say in the first six months, you can replace on a balance of benefits basis. But after six months, just 
pay pro rata for a new person because we don't know what the other person has left and you really you may really disadvantage the next person. This is different from even when the person that left is a man and the person that coming on board is a woman. What's the replacement replacement that's going on board that's going on there? So things like maternity care, child care benefit, all of those things. If somebody is single, a person coming on board is married. So you have all those dis disparities that make replacements harder, but not impossible. So you can just find a design around it if it is something that is of real concern. Companies that have a lot of charm, what we try to design for them is where we allow them to replace at any point in time, but then we charge them a small premium, all right, for being able to do that. And if they replace on a named basis, i.e. Mr. A left, I'm replacing Mr. A, then the person that is coming on board is only getting the balance of what Mr. A did not use. But if they replace just, oh, I had 10 staff, I'm down to nine, I'm adding number 10, they just pay, pay prorated premium to the end. But you find a way to make it work, but that just requires conversations. Then next question, what is the position of the recent NHA Act on HMOs in the private sector? The act is quite clear that the uh, nobody can be prevented from buying a private plan. All it says is that for you to buy a private plan, you must have a state plan already. So that's the point I made in the bonus presentation. So really, I think if implemented properly, HMOs should become stronger and bigger. Um, okay, how do we reduce cases of impersonation where the principal or dependent decides to allow a third party to use their plan to access care. Ah, we solved this problem since so, hmm, this problem. We solved this problem. People are onboarded with their picture. So we tell providers, no photo, no access, no apologies. So if you bring someone that is not the person, you, the provider, you are confirming that you saw this person, that's the person. So, but we know that people are cheating. So if you didn't have a, a picture on the system, we cut you off. So now the only way someone can bring someone that is not covered is that the provider is in collusion with them to do that. There's no, we have not been able to solve collusion problems, but if they are caught, the provider loses the payment and will report the staff to their um, principals in their company. Um, how can telemedicine be embraced to reduce medical care? How reliable is it? Thank you very much for this question. I think that is so critical. Telemedicine, uh, I'm not, I don't know that all HMOs have it, but certainly at Hygiene, we've had it for the last three years, where you can call the doctor to discuss whatever the issue. It's only primary care, does not cover specialist care. It's only primary care. And the reason why it's only primary care for now, we're working on the specialist care portion of it, but for now it's only primary care. See, primary care, things are very generic, all right? Many, many things can be done without physical engagement because symptoms can be discussed and all that. And a lot of primary care interaction is about questions and commonly occurring issues. So those things can be done by video, all right, or telecall or chat, all right. The video function is available by our app, for example, for hygiene, where you can see the doctor, the doctor can see you. And from there, it goes on to either a prescription to pharmacy, which can be delivered to you, or you can go in there, or it goes to a test where you can go to the test. And that process keeps getting better and better and better. Is it reliable? Absolutely, absolutely. What we find is that for every 10 people that consult telemedicine, maybe two of them might end up being referred to the hospital for actual visit to a doctor uh, to be physically examined. And maybe one person might need to go into the hospital again because for, they were not satisfied or there was an issue. But for the vast majority, it works and they're quite happy with it. How does direct drug refill work? Why is it preferred to be released to go to the pharmacy to pick drugs? So the thing is that hospitals charge for drugs and they often load the drug cost higher than even the pharmacy. So as part of managing the cost, what HMOs they're doing was to say, you know what, just let's deliver the thing to you. Um, just give me one second, please. Um, so the, what, what essentially was happening so please just, guys, just give me one second. My son is just calling me. Just give me one second, please. Okay, so while we're at that, please, if you have any questions, again, let's ask. If we don't have any questions, then we'll, we'll round up. 
you can see that um, Obinaya has been very direct and factual. So we have any questions or concerns around HMO or around medical or around medical benefit for your employees. Or even maybe, hopefully, I was thinking somebody even asking for suggestions on how we will improve our employee wellness. I'm slightly surprised nobody has asked. Okay. <laughs> because prevention is better than yeah. Welcome back, Obinaya. Thanks, Jim. Okay, so um, the drug review process, I was explaining that. So from a cost management perspective, and about three years ago, we brought a, a, a partner, M Pharma, into Nigeria so they could try to help to manage costs at hospital levels. The hospitals refused because many of them were charging 200%, 1,000% markup on drugs. So one had to take it out from them because ultimately drugs constitute between 25 and 30% of medical costs. Most people that are going to a hospital do not live without medication, whether they need it or not, because the hospitals are trading drugs. So by moving a lot of that, especially for pruning disease out, you could begin to stabilize the cost of healthcare because what was happening was that many of the big pharmaceuticals were incentivizing the doctors to prescribe their medication and people that did not need the medication were simply being prescribed the thing anyway because they had to sell it and move it. So you want to change the incentives around that. Now, whether people get the drugs delivered to them or pick up the drugs is a matter of convenience now. Of course, if you get the drugs delivered to you, there's the delivery cost that is factored into it somewhere. If you pick it up directly, then it's slightly cheaper. But the, the principle is that, like everywhere in the world, there's a separation between medical consultation from pharmaceutical, from um, diagnostic testing. And that separation ensures that the costs are not being marked up across the value spectrum. Um, then some those question, in your opinion, should all employees have the same medical access and be on the same plan, or should more senior employees get better medical plan? Hey, now wow. See this question. Mm -hmm. I am neither socialist, all right, nor am I a communist. I think that different things matter to different people, all right, at different points in time. But if your plan included all kinds of benefits, then maybe it be available to be given to everyone. If you're more cost conscious, then you need to look for who you're giving benefits to. After all, it's not every employee that is given a car. It's not every employee that is given all allowances. So there's no reason why you cannot uh, have distinctions in cadres when you give plans. I think that people that try to give the same plan to all employees, for the most part, actually, I don't think they're very wise. Because imagine that your most senior staff do a lot of international travel, all right? You will need to give them benefits like evacuation, benefits like international cover. But the moment you try to give everybody the same benefit, it means you have to reduce those senior ones to that level and you're, you're managing those costs of the grid. You're back to the same place. All right, so I think rather than creating that supposedly level playing field, it's not really level and nobody really expects it to be. So don't set yourself on that kind of hurdle. Instead, give people plans that at the level you are, the plan is appropriate for what you're expecting from you in terms of life and all of that stuff. And everybody's always going to have a bit of excess or something that happens at some point. They can address those things there. I, I just think that we should not create an impression environment that is not really necessary. And distinction feeds people's ego and it's part of your retention strategy. So retain, that's your work. Your work is to retain people in the organization to do the work, not to try to equalize people. So, but that's just my private view for that. And someone said, I, I would suggest we allow employee who resigned from the company service to continue with HMO service since the premium cannot be transferred to a new employee. That's fine. The HMO is open to it. It makes no difference to them. So if you want to extend that, that would be great. So what tip do you have to generally drive employee wellness and encourage a healthy lifestyle? I think this is a great question. Um, um, and a number of things, right? You know, something like health care, all right, or wellness is something that the, the, the employee, the, the company, because if you want to enter that wellness space, you have to start thinking about it slightly differently. How can I ensure that people actually take those things seriously? And it's not just a cost in cure to tick the box. 
If you want people to meet a certain level of wellness, then you want to put some, incent so, some incentive around that. So if people pass their annual physical, all right, so no high blood pressure, this, that, 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 all right, what is the benefit to them? What's the reward for doing that? And the activities that they need to do to be able to get to that level, all right? What is the reward for doing that? So if you look at your workforce, it is possible to design something. The challenge that many companies have is that they want to do wellness, but they don't want to carry the cost of doing wellness, all right? But the, the right way to approach it in my view is that internalize the cost, then redistribute it. So if you design a wellness program, with your HMO, if you want, or a consultant, or whatever, based on achieving certain things, you can actually define the profile of your employees based on their wellness status, and that helps you to design the plan that you want. So you have a bit more control over that. But in reality, some people just say, give people access to the gym, give people access to spa. If you do that, you want to ensure they are using it so you can get the value. Because if you give them access to all those benefits and they don't use them, you will not get the value. So you just have them as costs on top of your normal premiums. So wellness is about something that you're involved in and driving. And like everything else, people respond to what they are being measured on. Then um, somebody said, but well, what effect does this said NHIA have on HMO and private sector? We discussed that before. Um, it doesn't, uh, the HMO is still there, just the nature of how it works will change a little bit, but it should be better for them in reality. In recent times, toxicity has been prominent in the work, workplace. How can HR improve mental wellness and how can employee assistance programs be developed and sustained? That's a great question. So a lot of things begin with a conversation and the acceptance that something is uh, okay. So we provide psychologic, um, psych uh, psychologist access on telemedicine as a private way to initiate that kind of support structure, all right? But fundamentally, what you want people to do really is to be comfortable with the idea that if you have a concern, that you can actually express your concern and people can support you, all right? Again, how people respond to that varies from workplace to workplace, depending on the age profile, cultural disposition, and the time in life of the people. Older people are less likely to want that or to accept that. Younger people are more likely to accept that. So there's no need for you to be trying to move an arrangement that is more appropriate for youthful um, group and try to impose it on, his, on an older group because the older group will not accept it. You're just wasting your money. However, what you want to try to do is to look for what is the best way to communicate an, an acceptance of challenges around these things so that it is not difficult to, for people to discuss it. Um, some companies have introduced counseling services within where the counselor can be booked on private diaries and people can go to that, but you'll find different ways of addressing that. People just need to know that, that, that going out to access this care does not count as being away from the office, does not count against you in any way, all right, so that they can actually use the service. Um, someone said that's what my company does. We, we, we do remove the project balance from the final pay. Okay. Um, Final question, should we, why should we subscribe to Hygiea HMO? What makes Hygiea different and how can we contact Hygiea? Thank you very much, Yemi, you are an angel. So I have pitched without being very focused on Hygiea and he has given me the opportunity to pitch uh, my own company. I'll tell you three, three or four things why um, Hygiea is different. Like I, I told one of my colleagues who uh, runs an HMO and I said to him that, you know, that without meaning to boast or to be proud, I'd say that Hygiea is arguably the best um, and most sustainable HMO in Nigeria today. Why is that? A, the business is profitable and it's designed to be. B, we underwrite the plans. There's no copy or paste. We design bespoke plans for you that are transparent. <coughs> I cannot get over this thing about being transparent. It is so important. C is that our reimbursement structure with providers is designed to ensure that you don't throw your money away. 
we actually check what the providers are doing. We hold them accountable and we provide you the information that you need. So ultimately, you can get the most value for your health insurance plan. D, we have a plan for whatever size or company, type of person that you, that you actually want to cover. We cover people from zero through to 85 years. From 60 to 85, we have a senior plan available for people so that your parents are not left out. <laughs> and truly, you have um, the benefits of health cover for your entire family, even those that are not paid for by the company. Just a moment, please. Yes, a large bottle of water. Drinking water is good for you. Yeah, so for, 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 for a hygiene perspective, the quality of the company, the quality of the benefits, the transparency of the benefits is critical. We are present across the entire country with a network of over 2,000 providers. We continue to grow our book of providers because we believe that everywhere in the country that service can be rendered, we must be available there to render the service. We're also innovative with benefits like telemedicine available, remote delivery of medication and diagnostics. And we are actually extremely innovative about looking for new opportunities to provide care or rather access to care for people. Again, lastly, I'll say that we try to pay attention to what all the stakeholders need. It's not just about us. We understand that we must be sustainable, but ultimately all the stakeholders must get their benefit for themselves. So whether it's the company, that sought to maximize its um, value or the enrollees that themselves were looking for access to care. We make that available through multiple platforms by which they can contact us if they have a challenge or go directly to providers. And all of this is virtual. Even our own staff, all right, must receive a benefit, which is what makes it all sustainable. And we believe that joining hands with us will not only improve the quality of Nigeria's health ecosystem, but the value for every practitioner long term. We're not perfect. We do get some things wrong from time to time, but we're a listening organization. We take the feedback, we improve, we respond, and we get better to serve you. How can you contact us? Um, um, I think if I put the www.hygiahmo.com uh, email address on the system. So I, I think that that's really it's the simplest way to get across to you can see maybe a, any, that any, maybe a business manager or somebody. Yes. So I think um, someone to talk to. I won't say you should put your number. Uh, you can just put, I'll put my assistant's number here so to make sure that if you have a need today, we are open for business, all right? We are ready to serve you. You know, my people understand that we exist just for the clients. So they don't, don't worry about the time of day. Don't worry about whether we are awake. We are always awake. I'm just about to give you my assistance number. If you call her now and say you got it from me, she'll just get up and answer you. She knows now. That's how we roll. Yeah, so this is her number. So much. I don't know if there's anybody that wants to ask their question by voice. Some people are so busy, they, they don't like typing. You can still maybe raise up your hand quickly. I can maybe take one or two if there's any. All Apart right. from Abin Bola that is laughing at me eh, for yes, saying I'm not from Abin Abin Bola for laughing. Abin Bola is laughing. I'm always open for business. My dear, my son, I will not come later on this bridge. Abby? Mm. Hello? 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 Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Wafai. I will look forward to. Um, if I let me just copy your stuff. Um, I'm coming. Let me write it somewhere. So I will not be waiting for Yemi to send me the information. You know, this, this is a market now. <laughs> a market. So let me just grab my market. Okay, mm -hmm. Abin Bola, you can speak. Please don't laugh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good evening. Uh, good evening, uh, everyone. My question go is um, regarding the telemedicine that Mr. Joshua talked about. I've been using telemedicine since last year now and I don't know. 
it's like a 50 50 chance and um, i don't know maybe it's the, like the hmo that i'm using but most times uh they tend to just ask you questions questions and then most times before i even answer and confirm the questions you just beat me just give me the drugs and tell me to it and then you just like i just don't have this like um confidence in telemedicine because i've used them now for over one year that's number one then secondly i was ill very seriously ill about a um, couple of months ago and then there was this excruciating pain that I kept having. And then while the nurse was treating me, I told her that they're supposed to give me a drug for this particular pain, but they didn't give me. And then the nurse told me that my sister, can I just advise you? And then she was looking if there was a camera there. And then when she saw that there was no camera there, and then she told me to go and buy the drugs outside. Hmm. That gave me like an impression of, the fact that this is the second time I'm changing HMO in my company, and then it's still the same thing. And then when you see them everywhere shouting, you think they are everything. And but by the time you start using the service, it's just zero, it's just mouths that they're making. Mm. Okay, uh, first, I apologize for your experience, but let me kind of unpack it for you. The second one, please don't blame your HMO for the hospital's behavior. All right, don't. If you blame your HMO for the hospital's behavior, you're, you're effectively trying to transfer responsibility for someone else's bad behavior to another person. It will that if as long as you're using that hospital, or it doesn't matter, they will keep behaving like that because whatever their incentive is to do that is their incentive. Now the nurse that told you to go and buy outside, maybe she knows that they have bad practices inside. So she's asking you to save yourself and go outside. But, you know, fundamentally, if something is smelling, something is smelling, all right? We shouldn't say more um, than that. But that's not really an HMO problem. You know, what, what, I, what I always tell hospital owners is that you are responsible for your business. When you start be becoming funny, depending on who you're meeting, it's your own integrity you are playing with, not anyone else. So don't play with your integrity, run your business, and ultimately the benefits will come to you long term. The issue around the, what do you call it, the um, telemedicine platform, I don't know which platform it is, but I think a lot of people, how they're incentivized matters, all right? But what we try to tell our people, for example, with our platform is that when people call in on the platform, all the people, that spoke to the doctors on telemedicine platform. The telemedicine people must send us a report about those people every week. It comes on Friday morning, all right? And then we proceed to call all the people. So they spend all day calling the people on Fridays, all right? Trying to get across to just validate that people went to hospital, people went to hospital, people went to hospital. I say hospital, I say they call the telemedicine guys. And then we do a service verification so we can take feedback. At the end of the month, we have a session with the telemedicine people to give them the feedback. So we've been trying to do this to improve the service over time. The way we've structured our arrangement with telemedicine guys is that whether they spend one minute with you, whether they spend one hour with you, there's no difference to them. But if you complain about their service, there'll be a difference to them. So that way we hold them accountable. All right, and it's getting better. So initially they were just like a standalone service provider. But when, as people start complaining that the time it takes for them to finish seeing, talking to the doctor and then getting their prescription that they were given, sent or approved through Hygieia, as people start complaining about that, we start getting more, we start integrating the two. So now that the telemedicine doctor can actually give the prescription directly instead of sending a mail after. But the service will keep improving. And I hate to say it, but if that service doesn't work for you where you are, you can either purchase a standalone service, and if you go to our site, it's there. Or I don't want to uh, be aggressive about taking somebody's business, but we certainly will welcome your business. OK, thank you so much. We can actually take one more question, if any. 
Okay. Would you like to ask your question? Can you raise up your hand and we allow you to speak? Or we can call it an evening. I'd like to thank uh, the over 70 people at some point who joined this session. As always, this session will be recorded, has been recorded, and in the next 30 minutes will be uploaded on the same um, platform. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to sincerely thank uh, Obinaya Abadji for your time. This has been roughly two hours because you logged on way ahead of time and um, while we were waiting for the session to, to commence. We do not take this um, for granted. The, he and his organization understand this business and they are here um, for, for the long term. He has graciously dropped the phone number and contact of his uh, personal assistant. So if you need to reach out, do not um, hesitate to do so. You can also go um, to their website. Okay, please feel free to do that. All right, thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. We just allow Obinaya to take his closing remarks. We have after party today for after this session, we'll close officially and then we'll take any random HR question that has nothing to do with uh, health or medical. Okay, all right, your closing remarks, sir. Thank you very much, Jamie. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you to everyone who participated. I'm amazed at the number of people um, that joined and the levels of engagement. Thank you so much. Um, I do hope to see um, greater understanding and involvement of HR and moving this thing forward for one simple reason. Ultimately, our health determines the productivity of our workforce. A sick population can never be a productive population. So these are the core of what we are doing. And finally, I like to think of myself as my brother's keeper. We are only as well as the person, as the, as the, as the sickest person around, or really, if you think about what happened in COVID, where a few people getting something that was viral eventually led to the whole world shutting down. So we must make sure we have a strong health system and all of us must join hand in hand to make this thing work. Lastly, my motivation as a person to do this is that I won't always be looking like this and as young as I am. One day I'll be elderly, one day I'll need a system to support me. If I don't build that system when I'm young and capable, it's not when I'm old that I can make a demand on that system. I don't want to be my father's, I don't want to be my forefather's. I want to be able to look forward to retiring in a system that actually works. So I'm investing in it today. Thank you for joining hands with me and everyone else to do the same thing. I'm very grateful.